My guest today is Robert Hookman Jr., an innovation strategist with two decades of experience in product design, UX design, thinking, product design methodologies, lean principles, and rapid experimentation. He is the author of several books, including the acclaimed bestsellers, Designing the Obvious, and Experience Required, How to Become a UX Leader Regardless of Your Role. Today, we're mostly going to talk about another book of his, The Tao of User Experience, which is awesome. Robert, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. So the first question, organizations have goals and objectives, and once they have these, they tend to think through how to hit them, and that thinking is called planning. So it strikes me to be a pretty, pretty reasonable thing to do, planning, but let me read the preface to this book. Just so we're clear, goes the text, a design is a plan, to design is to plan, a designer is a planner. Now my question is, can a company plan to innovate? Wow, that's a great opening question. Can a company plan to innovate? Uh, I think absolutely. Um, and it's really easy to do, actually, once you dig into the, the process of, of strategizing and innovation. Um, so for me, that starts by basically diagramming what the current reality looks like. Um, you know, uh, uh, a lot of startups talk about the idea of, you know, falling in love with your market before you fall in love with your idea. Interesting. Uh, I think the same thing is true in enterprises uh, and, and in startups alike. Um, but the idea is, you know, go figure out what problems currently exist in your in your market uh, and then diagram those out and say, OK, where are the problems within that uh, within that current reality? And once you've identified a problem and a market who cares about that problem, you have an opportunity to innovate. Mm -hmm. The delta between those two points is is your is your space for innovation. Um, and from there, it's a matter of identifying, you know, uh, what potential solutions might exist to those problems. Uh, how important are those solutions? How critical are those problems that you're basing the solutions on? Um, how big of an audience do you have for those potential solutions? Um, and then, you know, starting to prioritize them and figuring out, you know, which, which ones are you going to try to take on first? Uh, and how are you going to get them out of the world and prove that they're good ideas? Um, so, uh, that's kind of the, the, the long answer, but the, the short answer is yes, I think you can absolutely plan to innovate as long as you have a market with a problem that has not yet been solved or has not yet been solved. Well, you have an opportunity to go after that and do it better than other people have. See, one, one of the challenges I have with this is that to a certain extent, it seems to me that the innovation process is kind of open-ended, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't know if you're gonna come up with a solution, right? There's an inherent uncertainty to it and the exploration process might not conform to your, your pathetic human need for things to happen during a time frame, an arbitrary you know, number of seconds in a year or whatever, months, minutes, days, months, right? So like, I, I feel like there's something threatening to planning that comes from not knowing the answer. I see. So we're talking about time constraints and things like that. I Can mean, you listen, in yeah, it? sure. Right. Because like, <laughs> if you think about, I mean, and I, I, I set up the question in kind of a particular way, because thinking from like a perspective of like a financial planning and analysis person, the people who run the corporate plan, right. They say the goal is like, it's not some high minded thing. If we want to solve problems, you know, you know, generate some social uh, benefit, right. Which is really what companies do, right. They, they bring something to the world that the world wants. But they, you know, they care about that, but they don't care about that because what they want to do is they want to hit a number and a bunch of numbers. And they're really yeah. important hitting those numbers. And, and to me, that's like, like the, the idea I want to play with a little bit here is that we're using planning in a couple of different ways, kind of, I think. And I'm really intrigued by that tension. Yeah. So that's, that's an interesting point uh, and, and an interesting angle. So, so yeah, you're right. Um, ultimately, businesses always care about numbers. Um, Ultimately, businesses only care about numbers. Sure. Uh, uh, and, and this is something I actually talk about pretty often. I think ultimately, uh, every project I've ever worked on and every project that probably has ever existed in, in the, the UX space, uh, in, in the software development space, in the tech space, has been um, about one of three goals. And those goals are making more money, spending less of it, or both. Sure. Um, and everything you do can be mapped back to one of those three goals. Um, and so planning, you know, very often for, for a company comes down to, well, how much money do I need to invest in a certain amount of time to get X outcome? Um, and to that extent, it can be very difficult to plan innovation because you don't 
you can never truly know if if the thing that you put forth into the world is going to stick or not if it's actually going to be an improvement over something uh until you do it until you actually put it out there and until you actually get an audience for it um it's all speculation until you actually deliver something so um, and that's something i've been saying for i think 20 years <laughs> it's all speculation until you put it out in the world so so planning innovation according to a, a deadline um is a tricky proposition um, however, planning, um, planning objectives according to a timeline, I think is, is much more reasonable, um, because that, so that's sort of a pivot in the thinking, um, that I think helps, uh, free up the log jam there a little bit. So you can't necessarily say, oh, I'm going to put out X, Y, and Z features over the next three months, and that will be our innovation and we'll have done it. Yay. Um, you can't really do that. <laughs> what you can do is say in the next three months, I would like to improve our conversion rates by 5% hmm. um, and improve our retention rate by 6%. You can set that kind of an objective and then pursue any and all reasonable paths toward achieving that. Um, so don't constrain yourself or pigeonhole yourself into a particular solution. Figure out what it is, you know, what is the business objective that you're chasing after and then look at any and all paths that, that might take you there. Uh, I do think that very often, I mean, it's nothing's ever a guarantee, but, but very often, more often than not, in my experience, when you, when you focus on the objective rather than on the thing that you're going to build, um, and you open up multiple paths to achieving that objective, uh, it becomes uh, much, much more feasible to, to accomplish that objective in a, in a certain time frame. So allow me to read uh, an item from the book, Power of User Experience. The problem expressed by the user is almost never the real problem. The real problem is almost never the first one you identify, or the next, or the next. <laughs> I love it. I mean, it, 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 you know, back to this idea of open-endedness, right? Like, there's this sometimes a really deep hole you got to go down because the layers of misperception can run deep, which is why it's so hidden, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, it's, it's, it's so funny to be talking about this book because I, I seriously haven't even picked up a copy and looked at it in, I don't know, three or four years. So hearing these, uh, hearing these things, like, I, <laughs> one thing I'm glad about so far is that everything you've said is still something I absolutely 100% believe. So <laughs> my opinions have not changed. The, the foundation is, is, is still in total agreement with my past self. That's nice. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> Um, but yes, the, the, the problem that you uncover is very rarely the problem. Um, and this is chronic uh, in product development. Um, and it is the number one reason that critical thinking skills are so incredibly pivotal to successful product development. Um, because uh, there are frameworks, like critical thinking frameworks, um, to... Uh, that are, are meant to help you get to the core, um, the, the core of the issue, right? Mm. Uh, so very often uh, the problem that we'll hear about from a customer, from a user, from a business person, what have you, is uh, something very at the top. It's, it's the symptom of the problem. Yep. Um, and if we, you know, go about tackling that problem with a solution, uh, tackling that problem as it's been framed with a solution, uh, it will ultimately a band -aid, be a Band-Aid, and, uh, and it could actually make things worse. Uh, and that actually happens a lot. So, um, so one idea from, uh, from critical thinking, and actually, uh, yeah, is, is the idea of the five whys. And so, like, that's a very simple framework. You know, ask the five whys. Well, why does this occur? Well, why does that occur? Uh, and keep digging until you find the, the, the root cause. It's actually part of root cause analysis in critical thinking. Um, and, and, and the reason to do that is because you'd be stunned just how often nobody knows or nobody has asked the question before. Yeah. Uh, so if you are the one asking why, why, why over and over again, uh, and I think I've written about this multiple times in my life, if you're the one asking why over and over again, you will almost invariably find out that no one has asked those questions previously. And you will almost invariably land at the root cause, the actual problem that you're trying to solve, the actual business objective uh, that could be attained by solving it, the actual stakes. You could be the one to figure that out. And when you are the one figuring that out, you get to drive the conversation. 
<laughs> so now, you know, a, a whole lot of projects I've been involved with, you know, when you ask that question enough times, you, you find out um, there's no there there. You may mm -hmm. find out, oh, you know what? There's actually not a good reason to try to solve this problem. It's not an actual problem. We just thought it was. <laughs> Um, but once we dug into it, we found out the real problem is something else, and we can solve that by doing something else entirely. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it, it's incredibly important to me, and I, 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 I talk about it a lot. And I think I, I lead by example by doing this uh, all the time in projects, uh, asking those questions and pushing, you know, pushing through what I hear to try to find out what's behind it. Uh, and and ultimately get to the to the real heart of uh, of a problem so it can be solved um, clearly. A lot of times the the problem we hear about again is a symptom, and when you solve the real problem, the symptoms just disappear. So l let me let me kind of uh, do one more of these on this theme. There's a bunch of really cool themes in in the book uh, and to to this to this world of UX. So human beings do not know why they do what they do. They do not know what they would do in hypothetical situations. Observe. It is the only way to learn. Yes. <laughs> they don't want to lie to you, but yeah. they do, and to themselves. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that's very well said. <laughs> um, they don't intend to lie to you. Um, people don't intend to be terrible self-reporters and to say that they would do one thing and actually do another. They don't intend to do that. Um, people are just really bad at self-reporting. Uh, you know, it's very hard for us to imagine when we're in an interview situation talking to a researcher who's asking questions about a hypothetical situation. It's really difficult for us to honestly come up with the right truth uh, to that question. Um, things are very different in those contrived situations of, of interviews, research interviews like that, than they are in real life. When we're facing real circumstances, when we're in the middle of doing 10 different things at once, and uh, you know, now my job is actually dependent on being able to complete this task, let's say, um, and it, it, it's a very, very different thing. So there's always this is a gap between what someone thinks they're going to do or say or think or believe or react. Uh, in a in an interview than how they actually do it in real life. Um, and so in solution development, uh, that's, that's a really key thing to accept uh, and to embrace uh, and to try to mitigate against um, by, you know, using those, those sort of qualitative and, and interview type research situations to inform a solution, but then actually truly evaluating that solution by putting something out there and seeing how it plays out in real life. So, the, the, I mean, you mentioned critical thinking skills a minute ago, and I really, I don't like you using that term. I, I'm sure it's perfectly <laughs> accurate, but to me, it allows the listeners of this podcast to kind of slot this into, oh, this is something I understand. Because I've heard of critical thinking skills before, right? And they probably even might take a course on it. Maybe they even use them once in a while. But I just find that there is something so deeply contrarian to the kind of culture you need to be a part of to be a great, you, you, like, you know, I think there's another one. I don't have it open um, uh, on the page, but there's one of the quotes in here which says, question everything, absolutely everything, right? And not just some things, not just things that are important. Like, ab absolutely, like, you have to be willing to deny to be an ultimate skeptic, right? A and that, to me, is, like, really, I'll use the word subversive, right, to, to like, uh, to institutional authority. Like, you walk into a business or anybody who has a problem, and you start questioning everything. People can be threatened by that. And, you ha and then to be successful at this job, it feels to me like you need to be able to be immune to that kind of social pressure that they put on you to conform to their concepts, right? Because you know they don't know what the heck they're doing or why they're doing it, but they don't believe they don't know. They think they know. You know, I'm a big successful businessman. I know what I'm doing here. And you're like, uh, -uh you don't. Nobody does. It's not just you. It's everybody. And he's like, I, you know, and they, I have to think that that you've had circumstances where you felt uncomfortable because of what you felt you needed to do to pursue the truth. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot to unpack in that response. <laughs> um, so yeah, critical thinking first, let me, let me go to that first point. So critical thinking is definitely one of those things that I think a lot of people believe that they understand, mm. um, much in the same way that user experience is. 
uh, it's one of those terms that can be used very glibly um, and thrown around and not really defined. Uh, and as long as a group of people refuse to define it, everybody in the group can define it differently. Uh, and they can walk away with their own interpretations and their own uh, understandings and, and what have you. And as long as that term goes undefined, then it's, you know, everybody just sort of projects onto the term what yeah, they want. Sure. Um, <laughs> I always equate it to the mask of Michael Myers because it's this yeah. blank face and you can just, whatever fear you've got, you can plant it on that face. Um, the exact same thing is true for the term user experience and the term critical thinking. Um, I've heard the term critical thinking thrown around, uh, thrown around a lot, you know, and everybody goes, oh, yeah, yeah, we really need to do some critical thinking about this. But what does that truly mean, you know? Um, I don't know how many people have actually taken uh, courses in critical thinking, how, how many people have actually really uh, learned the rigor of critical thinking. Um, and it's, it's an incredibly important skill. I mean, it, it basically, I mean, it applies in all sorts of ways, but it's basically, you know, one huge strategy to critical thinking is like, you know, identifying a real problem, identifying what the key success factors are, identifying potential pathways to achieving it, um, which attributes of those potential paths are most important. Um, and then, you know, which are the most feasible and which ones contain elements of risk and how much risk and how much risk are you willing to absorb? And, and basically, like, you know, crafting a pathway forward um, by answering all of those questions. And so when I say question everything, absolutely everything, um, that's what I mean. So like, you know, first let's talk about the problem. Every part of the, the, the critical thinking problem solving path involves a different set of questions. Uh, and this is something uh, that I think of as diagnostic inquiry, in fact. Um, and the idea is, you know, when you're defining a problem, uh, there are a whole bunch of questions that never get asked. Uh, so just to make this, you know, really uh, concrete, just in one specific phase, there are a whole bunch of questions that never get asked, such as, um, who said that this is a problem? Um, right. Why is it a problem? Yeah. Um, are the people who said it, it's a problem, are, they, are those people important to us? Um, and why? <laughs> and uh, how do we know it's a problem? And what are the stakes of the problem? And do we need to solve the problem? And how well do we need to solve the problem? Mm -hmm. And what happens if we don't solve the problem? <laughs> there are all these basic problem definition questions that most people just skip right over, right? Yep. And we do that in a, in a lot of situations and we go, well, we think this is a problem and we think this is a solution, go. Uh, and then we just go flying into action. Um, and so that's partly what I mean by, you know, question everything. Um, and that's definitely what I mean by critical thinking. Um, to the other part of your, um, your riff a moment ago about the, the social pressure of questioning everything, <laughs> Um, I, I, I'm starting to think, hey, I, I don't know what's on the next page uh, in that book. I, I have no memory of it, but I'm wondering if maybe it should have been, you know, do it artfully. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. Because there's, <laughs> there's a way to go about yeah. questioning everything. It's not just brute force, you know, being antagonistic. Uh, sure. That never gets anybody anywhere. Uh, but there is a way to, to ask these questions in an honest and genuine way and in a humble way. Uh, that will earn you respect. I mean, it's basically, I mean, if you think about the, put it, let's put it in context of the Socratic method. Um, so Socrates is legendary uh, as a philosopher because of the Socratic method, which is basically all he ever did was ask his students questions and then more questions and then more questions until they revealed, till they came across and revealed their own flaws in their thinking. Mm -hmm. Um and at one point, you know, he was, while he was alive, he was revered as the wisest man alive. And he was like, how can I possibly be the wisest man alive? All I ever do is ask questions. Um, you know, he never actually posited anything. <laughs> he just asked people questions until they came to their own conclusions. Um, so the, the, the Socratic method in a, in, a, in a solution development context, uh, for me, it works very much like that, you know. Um, so it's basically about, you know, asking those questions humbly, really just being open and curious uh, and, and, and also knowing what kinds of things that you need to know in that situation. So um, let me try to make that concrete. So I'm working on a project right now where a business person has decreed to a team um, this thing should be done. Um, over the next three months, you should devote all of your time to absorbing this product over here into this product 
Um, and no one on the team can actually figure out why that is. Um, at, at first, no one on the team asked why that was. Um, they all said, oh, okay, we're going to go do that, and then started planning for it. Uh, and then someone uh, on the team started asking questions about it, which was, oh, okay, well, uh, if we're going to do that, then what are the business outcomes are we going to achieve that we're going to achieve by uh, what's, what's going to happen as a result of us absorbing this one product into another? Um, and in attempting to answer that question, uh, she quickly found out that, like, nobody knew. The product manager didn't know. The project manager, the engineers didn't know. No, no one was like, they were all like, but you don't understand. Our job is to, you know, someone said this product needs to be pushed into this other product, so we're going to go do that. That's our job. That's what we're held accountable to. But she said, you know, but what business effect does that have? Um, because if we know that business effect, then we can evaluate what we've accomplished. That's where meaning comes from in our work. Meaning is not derived just from doing the thing that we were tasked with doing. Meaning comes from attaching the work that we've done to the effect it had. And she was asking that question. What is the effect that we're going to have? Uh, and it turns out no one knew the answer. Um, and it turns out the more digging she has done, the more she has come to the conclusion there actually not only appears to be no good reason to do this, to absorb one product into the other, um, but there actually, it, it actually may be a bad idea to do it because doing it may expose this company to a legal risk <laughs> that no one had thought about yet. Uh, and if you look very glibly at the reasons to uh, merge this old product into the new one, it was, you know, it was basic stuff like, oh, this product fits into this category, so it should work the same way. The same team can support it. Or, oh, this product over here doesn't currently have a development team behind it, so let's put it over here so it does have a development team behind it. Um, but uh, so that's, those are the glib uh, motivations for uh, absorbing one product into another. Um, but the use cases for the users of these two products were wildly different mm. um, to the extent that, as far as we can tell at the moment, it would actually be really bad to push this product into the other one. Um, and, but no one had asked that question. No one had, uh, no one had done that. And so just by you know, this, this, um, this researcher who, who kind of went in and started asking these questions, you know, I just want to understand the business impact so we know uh, how, what we're going to accomplish in doing this because that's how, we, and, and that's how we measure our progress. That was the approach she took for asking the question. And then it's very non-confrontational. It's honest. It's genuine. It's like, look, I want to know what meaning there is uh, in this effort for us. Uh, and so that we can prove, we can come back to you later and say, hey, we accomplished this. Hooray. Uh, we accomplished the thing that we set out to do, but we don't, at the moment, we don't know what that thing is. <laughs> so approaching the questioning in that way um, made it very non-confrontational, which meant, you know, she was able to um, ask those questions and sort of work her way through a series of conversations uh, without, you know, just being like the, <laughs> the, 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 the resident antagonist or the naysayer. Like she just wasn't, you know, she wasn't just going in there to be combative. She was going in there to, find meaning in things and people respond to that um so so there is an artful way to to question everything uh and i think it's all about you know knowing why it is that you want to know the answers and just getting people to sort of buy in with your rationale about about uh why that information matters okay so let me let me touch on another question that touches on this theme I, there's like several times in which i could have asked this question i'm gonna nail it now because i love this and i, I myself am still interpreting it the less important the task is to the user, the less tolerant he is of its obstacles, and the less willing she is to persist through them. This does not mean that we should make the task easier. Des design for the common and the important. All else should remain accessible but in the shadows. Accept the complaints, do not adjust for them. What does that mean? Accept the complaints, do not adjust for them. Okay. Um, when so do you that, ignore users? That is somewhat specific. Okay. <laughs> um, and that's a weird contrarian phrase, somewhat specific, but <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm always very concerned with precision in language. So, <laughs> so it's a weird thing to say, uh, somewhat specific. But the idea there is that um, I have seen a tremendous number of designers and product teams try to solve 
uh, for making something easier when it does not necessarily need to be easier or it doesn't need to be easier for that person. Or uh, in many cases, it's actually beneficial for it not to be easier. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> so this is contrary to a lot of what, uh, you know, is trained into our brains as user experience professionals, right? The idea that something should not be easier. Um, but think about... Um, let me see if I can come up with a good example. Um, I, you know, uh, it's going to elude me at the moment, but uh, let, let's think about something that might be a setting. Or can I or, give you? Can yeah. I give you an interpretation? I, I sure. think I know where you're going with this because uh, I was thinking about. I thought about this one a lot, and I thought, you know, sometimes there are niche users who are diehard who will do anything mm -hmm. to use mm -hmm. this product, right? But there's no like gradual slope to like the general population. Nobody else wants it other than the hardcore, right? And the hardcore will walk through fire and roll over coals or whatever they have to do to get it. And you know, making it easier for them will not add any more users. It just makes it easier for them. And they're already using it. So there's no problem here, even though there are some things you could do to simplify it. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, and I think there are other situations where that applies as well. But yeah, the thinking is that, you know, not every task needs to be easy. Yeah, um, right. So for one, think about, you know, let's say you're filling out, uh, I don't know, a, a complicated tax form or something online. <laughs> um, uh, it would behoove uh -huh. the company to actually make the user slow down yeah. uh, and actually make sure that they're entering the right information. So you, you don't necessarily want that to be the quickest thing that happens. You want it to be more accurate. Hmm. Accuracy matters more than speed. Um, so easier may not be the the right solution uh, in that case. Um, in other cases, you're exactly right. There might be, you know, a, a certain segment of your audience that is somewhat of a power user, um, and they are, you know, they they have uh, tasks that they're commonly interested in, but 95% of your audience couldn't care less about. Um, and so, should you make that um, front and center? Probably not. You should make it readily available and accessible for the people who are taking advantage of that thing. Absolutely. Um, but um, putting something front and center that would be disadvantaged or disadvantageous to the rest of your audience, the larger portion of your audience, could actually make their experience worse. Um, not, the, not the least of which <laughs> reason would be that um, sometimes, actually very often, always, <laughs> when you enable a possibility in a product you, there's a very fine line between enabling it and, and encouraging it. Um, so just because something is possible in your product, because somebody needs it, the fact that it now exists means that people think they're supposed to use it or that <laughs> they're, they're now being encouraged to do a thing that they, that they didn't need to do or they didn't need to worry about. Mm. Um, and so part of the, the thinking behind that um, sort of tenet uh, and the DAO of user experience was the idea of, of, of hiding some of those things, making them available, but not sticking them out, you know, front and center in your product where people are going to inadvertently be encouraged to use them when it, when it wouldn't benefit them to do so. I got another one that I love that uh, I just really am fascinated by. And I want to, I want to hear you explain, expand on this. Great design is not the logical conclusion to research, but the result of courageous belief in what you're doing. The word courageous, there's a lot of moral valence to some of the language in this, which I think just is so awesome, and I want to dig into some more of that later on, but courageous. Tell me about that word in this, in this concept. Yeah, that one, I think, um, my thinking at the time was about the, the difference between research and vision okay. uh, and the difference between user needs and what you are actually interested in as a business. Um, I, I, I've spent a lot of time in my career working with startups, um, and... Startups, you know, especially the founders of a startup, I mean, anybody who has a job is basically saying, I'm going to sign over a whole bunch of hours of my life for this particular audience, for this particular product, for this particular uh, niche or this industry or what have you. And especially the founders of a company, like mm. they are giving over huge chunks of their lives to this product and this market. Um, and... Uh, and, and I constantly think, you know, they have to be absolutely in love with, the, with what they're doing. They have to believe in their idea. And so there has to be some 
chutzpah behind that. There has to be some gumption. You know, there's some fierce belief that they're doing something better in the world. They're doing something that matters. They're doing something important. They're doing something that will disrupt an industry, make somebody's lives, you know, life, life better. Um, <clears throat> and when you only focus on, on, on f- what flows out from the research, you can neglect all that. Mm. You, can, you, you can end up with stuff that's not that exciting. <laughs> you can end up going down a track and saying, oh, well, based on what I learned from my audience, I think, you know, X, Y, and Z would be great solutions, but they're also not that interesting to me as a human being. And if I'm going to spend five years of my life working on this thing, I need to be engaged. <laughs> yeah. And I need to believe that somebody's going to care wildly about this. And it's not just some, you know, the next boring evolution of, of, of a thing that already existed. Um, so for me, it's kind of pitting, you know, the research against the vision and also uh, putting the research that you get through the lens of your vision. So the things that you learn about your audience, um, I see a lot of companies um, take what they learn from audiences as gospel. Um, so our audience would like us to do A, B, and C. Um, but our audiences would like to do a whole lot of things that may or may not have anything to do with our product vision or where we're, where we're trying to go. And so you have to kind of put the research that you get through that lens. Like, what am I trying to accomplish here? Um, and you have to be courageous enough to believe in your product vision and and balance that with the research that you get instead of giving over entirely to one direction or the other. If you come only out of research, you might do something boring. If you go only into your vision and and neglect research, you might do something terrible. (laughs) It's the overlap between those things, the complement between those two things that I think uh, is where great products come from. So you've, you've got to be aiming high, but informing that high aim with, um, with truth and intelligence. So uh, I just, I, it's kind of repetitive to this conversation, but I cannot help but read number 95. All progress depends on the breaking of rules, the questioning of standards, the defying of the status quo. It is not a flight of fancy to do so, to achieve anything worth achieving. It is a moral imperative. Moral imperative. Man, that is powerful language. Seek out those who separate themselves from the pack. Separate yourself from it as well. That's great. You saved that one for 95. I mean, where, so where does like, where does, where does the vision come from? You know, like, because here, here's a, th- I, did this, I did this interview uh, early on in my own journey as a, as a kind of UX researcher, I guess. Um, I, had this, I had this intuition that, you know, looking from the outside in the insurance industry, right, where everybody, everybody is maligns software because it's, it's, a, it's a burden to insurance companies, the software, they hate it. Love hate, but mostly hate. I, I used to joke that the, the customer satisfaction rate of policy management system, which is like the sort of technological core of an insurance company, was zero. Everybody had their system. Everybody <laughs> was changing their system. Everybody, you know, it was like this loathsome um, burden that you have to bear. And I thought, you know, what is the difference between these organizations and the organizations that build great software? Because there's lots of great software out there. There's wonderful things that are miraculous. And I had this sort of feeling that it lay somewhere in this product design kind of product management kind of world. Because that was a function that I just, I just didn't really know anything about. And um, as I have learned more about this business, I've narrowed it down to really, it's, it's, it's a kind of UX research is, the, is a critical piece. But it's insufficient because that helps you mold something, it seems. But, you know, I was reading this book uh, as a podcast at the beginning of the journey for me. Uh, this gal named Melissa Perry called The Build Trap. I'm going to link to it in the show notes. But she has this, this she, it's like an evolution of kind of this agile framework where she talks about how you have this cascading kind of prioritization, right? So at the top of the organization, you have something called a vision, a mission, or whatever, right? Some constraining of the world saying, we're going to work on this subset of problems, right? Mm-hmm. And as you go down the organizational kind of work chart, you, you kind of constrain that more and more and more. And like you're now in this little piece and you're on this. It all sits underneath the same umbrella, right? It has to in order for the company to hold together, which is what is interesting to me. So at the time, I thought the constraint must be grading on the people in the company because they're saying, I want to solve these problems, but here you're telling me I can only work on these few things. What I have learned since is that constraints are liberating, right? Saying now work within this area and here, here's the sandbox. Go figure out how to solve the problems in the sandbox. And that somehow is a more powerful kind of directive than the world is infinite, go figure it out. What do you think? Yeah. Um, So again, a lot to unpack in that. Um, 
the yeah first uh, I absolutely believe in constraints I think anything you're doing without constraints is um, 100 percent creative and there's absolutely something to that but even within something that's 100 percent creative there are constraints you're making formal decisions about the structure of your creativity and mm. there there are always constraints uh, and in a, in a business context in a product development context like the cons the constraints are where the creativity happens um, they are the things that put guardrails around possibilities um, in a way that enables possibilities uh, and that's uh, I realize a pretty abstract idea but I can't you know I, I can't imagine being being able to do forced being being forced to do good thinking in a situation where there were no constraints. Um, because without that honed focus, um, what's going to inspire your best idea? Unless there are some guardrails around it. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, uh, the beginning of that quote um, was very much inspired by a, a line from Ralph Nader, um, who was the guy who... who behind the gargantuan effort, and it took him, I think, years to do this, to get uh, car manufacturers to adopt um, the idea of putting seatbelts into every vehicle. Yeah. Uh, and eventually it became a law, right? Now they all have to have seatbelts. But yeah. like that didn't used to be true, and Ralph Nader made it happen. He was a, a consumer advocate um, to the extent that he like he it took over his life. <laughs> right. uh, and, and he, you know, at one point, uh, in his life said all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Um, and I absolutely love that line uh, and that idea because user experience used to be an unreasonable idea. Um, so? And it's no longer true. What does that um, mean? It used to be unreasonable because companies thought that design was something pretty on the front and yeah. it didn't really matter if people could use it and they didn't really understand that people had trouble. They thought that they were hired to be, you know, product engineers and product managers, and therefore they knew better. Uh, and over time, some people chipped away at that idea and said, hey, it turns out that your users have no idea what your product does. They don't understand how to use it. They're not getting the benefit out of it that they want, and we can prove it. Uh, and over time, companies started to recognize that and listen. Um, user experience would not now be the household term that it is if it weren't for some unreasonable people about 20 years ago. Um, the unreasonable people made that important to the companies who, who weren't paying attention to it at the time and are now. Um, and, and in a product context, the unreasonable person might be the one who says, hey, let's stop doing the same thing that everybody else is doing and let's figure out if that actually solves the problem and let's go see if there's not something better. Um, the unreasonable person will be the one who asks all of those questions and says, what is the actual effect we're trying to achieve here? And how will our, how does our work map to it? Um, how does what we're doing right now help us achieve that big goal, that big vision? How, how do these dots connect? Um, and the unreasonable person is often the one who uh, will ask that question and who will find that answer. And a lot of people, uh, in a, even in, especially in situations when a lot of people just aren't uh, answering that question. Um, and so, yeah, you know, user experience became popular, uh, became a household term because of unreasonable people. Great products have been invented because someone decided to disrupt. In your industry, the insurance industry, there are plenty of disruptors right now. You know, like uh, it, I can think of several companies off the top of my head for uh, in the life insurance uh, spectrum um, where they've looked at the whole world of life insurance and said, you know what, we can make this really painless. We can make it easy. We can, uh, we can take on people that other people can't. We've got this new super streamlined, efficient way to do it. And they've tried to disrupt the life insurance industry. Um, and they can do that by being unreasonable, <laughs> by saying, we refuse to accept that the current way life insurance works is the only way that life insurance can work. Let's go find out what problems people have with it. Let's go find out how we can do it better. And let's be unreasonable and, and go after a new vision that ends up disrupting that, maybe making things better. You see, like I, I, I feel like in a lot of the insurance businesses, I think a lot of the vision stuff I hear is, I wouldn't say it's unreasonable. And honestly, like, you know, that what you're saying there, like, I, you know, I, I get it. I understand your point. Uh, but 
is it really so unreasonable to say people should have an easier time running? You know, I, I think that's kind of obvious to the point where there's another uh, another quote. Oh, you'll have to allow me a second to dig it up because I didn't think we were going to come into this one this quickly, but I'm going to find it where it says, I might even just have it, um, trends, standards, best practices, personal biases, mediocrity, outright foolishness, they are all the same, right? <laughs> Which I love that because it, you know, obviously, wonderfully, wonderfully written because it obviously starts with some things that, well, some things that are mixed, but some of them have purely positive connotation, best practices, standards, right? Mm -hmm. All the way to very negative connotation, outright foolishness, right? And so I think what you're saying here is that if you aren't thinking for yourself, then you aren't thinking and you're dead. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is a big underlying theme of that line. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, that's uh, about capturing the idea that um, best practices are very often not what's best. And best practices are very often half-baked ideas that grew, uh, that became popular uh, and scaled. <laughs> um, when I first became a consultant uh, in 2006, one of the first things I did was I spent three months working on um, some research papers from usability studies. Basically, we did like this huge eye tracking study. Uh, it was literally 300 hours of eye tracking usability studies around Web 2.0 design patterns, okay. um, such as like tag clouds and infinite scrolling. And some of these things have still, uh, you know, in start pages, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. things like that back when those ideas were popular. Um, and there were all these, you know, supposed design patterns that were best practices that people had latched onto and people were, were perpetuating into all sorts of product products. Um, and we went and studied them and it turned out like some of them were just ridiculously badly translated ideas like the tag cloud, but almost nobody, we interviewed 40 people, um, you know, across a number of these patterns and tag clouds just failed miserably. Like almost nobody understood I mean, what tag cloud meant. <laughs> you know, I, I get it. Like, I mean, I agree. I yeah. <laughs> Like they all thought, oh, so the, the bigger, darker word means like, oh, the designer wants me to click on that. It wasn't the result of like, you know, oh, this is sure. the most popular of these terms that has been searched for. They, it was just tag clouds were widely misinterpreted. They had low usability. Nobody really understood their motivation and they thought they were design driven rather than um, the result of other people's activities. Um, and, and, but, that, but it was a best practice. Do you remember how prevalent tag clouds were? They sure. were all over the place. It was insane. Yep. And, um, and this has been true in, in every year, every company I've seen since there's some quote unquote best practice, uh, that was really a half baked solution that just scaled. Somebody thought it was cool. And so they, they put it in more than one place. And the next thing you know, it's a design pattern. Uh, and then we call it, and then we misinterpret a design pattern as a, uh, as a best practice. Um, but so, so what I mean by that is that outright foolishness and uh, best practices can be grouped as synonyms um, because both, because best practices can be outright foolish. <laughs> um, and, and in order to find out if there's any meat on that bone, um, you have to go dig into whether the best practice is actually a best practice. Let's go study it. Um, and, and again, with that idea of questioning everything, let, let's dig into this and find out if people actually understand this best practice, if there is a better way, um, how this thing got adopted in the first place, um, how it scaled, how it became a best practice, and uh, if, if maybe there's some intelligent tweak we can make to it that will uh, significantly improve it. Um, so yeah, don't just, um, don't just blame the accept best practices. Don't just blindly accept standards. Question them too. Um, that said, I do believe there is some merit to best practices and standards. Sure. Don't throw them out. <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of them have a grounding in reality. Um, and, you know, not all of them, but a lot of them do. Uh, and if you are only reinventing things all of the time, you're going to have a really hard time getting anywhere. Uh, making any progress with your product and you can have a really hard time getting people to adopt your product because there's nothing for them to, to grab onto, nothing familiar, nothing they can assimilate to. Um, so if you throw it completely out, you, you, you might be lost at sea. Um, but if you rely strictly on best practices and standards, um, you will also not be making any headway and you'll be accepting a bunch of status quo 
uh, decisions that other people have made before you and that are not necessarily benefiting you or your audience. So what I, I think the book um, has a, ser- a series of themes. I alluded to this earlier. But the overall gist of it, I, I wonder if you agree with this. It's not kind of like complete and right in a deep sense because uh, it's not designed to be. I feel like this book is is sort of your contribution to a conversation, like correcting. It's unforgiving, right? So the book is relentless and unforgiving, right? It's it's forcing us, me, to acknowledge the hardest parts, right, and be open about them. And there's some things that are not so hard, which, you know, like your point earlier about uh, when you said, you know, on the next page, you probably said, you know, do it nicely. And you didn't say it on the next page. The next page, you turned to some other kind of deep and difficult and painful truth, right? Um, and because the nice thing, I mean, people can do that on their own. They don't need you to tell them to be nice to each other. Like, they will read somebody else for that one. For you, it's like, no, no, no. You know, we're going to, you know, we're going to line you up again, and we're going to make you run up that hill again <laughs> and do something awful because that's how you get better. Um, and, you know, I think that there's a dual kind of theme, two themes that I think go back to go, uh, when paired are especially unforgiving. And one of them is, is forcing us to continually realize how ignorant we are about ourselves and the people that we're talking to, right? So the idea of it's being very difficult to learn and difficult to know truth, right? It's not this idea. It's not the next one. It's not the next one. <laughs> you can keep going, man. It's going to take a while and a lot of hard work. And so that's kind of one piece. And then there's another piece, too, which is this interesting um, urging us to have agency, right? To say, it is, and I will tell you, uh, know this above all else. No matter the user's behavior, you made it happen. There's a sense of responsibility you have to have. Because even though it's hard, impossible to do this, too bad, it's on you, right? So there's a responsibility you have to actually do these things right, and you can't run away from that. All the more reason to approach everything with that beginner's mind, right? Mm. Because no matter what you design, no no matter what result you get, you enabled that result. Yeah. (laughs) Because it was your decision that got it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you put something out into the world and now you're seeing the effects of it and you're wondering how you got those effects. Well, you did something. What did you do? <laughs> um, so <laughs> how is it that you produced that particular effect blindly? <laughs> yes. I never saw that coming. Well, what did I do that made that happen? Um, so all the more reason to approach the world with that beginner's mind. Um, but to that first quote, or to the first theme, uh, yeah, they are, uh, they are both pretty tough uh, themes <laughs> to accept, but um, but that I, that I think is something uh, that is absolutely core to the way that I live my life. Like, I, I think the second that you're sure about something is the second before you're, you could be proven wrong. Um, and, um, you know, the more confident you are about your, your, your decisions uh, without backing them with something, with some sort of intelligence, with evidence, with uh, opinion, with corroboration, with... <laughs> The, the more confident you are about your decisions without any of that behind you, um, the more likely uh, you are to be wildly off uh, and, and wrong. And so I think, you know, we, um, it, and also situations change over time. So what was true six months ago under different circumstances may not be true now under this circumstance. Um, and so I, I don't think, you know, there's a, a heck of a lot of carryover to be had from one project to the next, a heck of a, uh, you know, uh, from one decision to the next. You still have to, to ask all the questions. You still have to examine it and go, okay, well, what's true here? Mm-hmm. Um, who is my audience in this case? What is their problem in this case? How important is this problem? Um, what is the best way to, to go about this? Why do I think that? And how can I prove it? Um, you always have to ask these questions in every situation. Uh, every decision has to be approached with that same sort of openness and that same sort of belief that you're looking for the answer instead of knowing the answer. I think it's incredibly important to to approach every decision that way because um, otherwise you're short-circuiting yourself. Um, You're short-circuiting good thinking. Um, You are... (laughs) putting yourself at a disadvantage. You are handicapping your ability to make a good decision by not examining all the factors. Um, and and that will show with that, that second theme that you mentioned. No matter what result you get, you enabled it. So if you didn't put good thought into it in the first place, you're going to get a bad result, and then you're going to wonder. I personally would rather start with the good thinking and, and get a result that I was conscious of, that I was cognitive of, uh, and that I wanted deliberately to achieve. 
So I, I, I think starting with that, with that open beginner's mind, that very Buddhist idea of the beginner's mind, start there and you will invariably uh, head in a better direction from the start. And, you know, I agree with that. And I think that the, here's the kind of the thing, which is important, that everybody else does too, right? Nobody says, I right. would rather not do the hard work up front and, you know, fail later. Um, yet we do, and we do because it's hard to do the hard work. It's hard work after all, uh, named appropriately. And, you know, I think that being able to summon the will to keep going on and on after it. You know, I, I, I always, this little feeling I had, I remember, so I was in the sales business for a little while and uh, client work, right? And, you know, there's always something going wrong. And I remember once in a while I'd had this little lull where there's a feeling of things are going kind of smoothly right now and I'm not hearing a whole lot and my hackles would go up, right? And you're like, there's a problem. I don't know. There's a bullet whistling towards the back of my head <laughs> right now. You know, I don't know where it is coming from, but I mean, it's out there and you got, and you, sit, you sort of have this panic and, you know, I think my, my kind of like sixth, sixth sense there, which was, you know, which was forged in the fires of failure, um, <laughs> was onto something because it is just hard, you know, and like, you got to kind of like find a way to embrace that and celebrate that, you know, love that struggle in a certain kind of way to, to really do anything worthwhile, I guess, maybe. Yeah. Um, and that's such an important point because I, I don't, you know, it is hard work. <laughs> it is hard work to always have the beginner's mind, to always approach things with that fresh, uh, fresh uh, drive for new knowledge, right? Uh, and to always, you know, refute the idea that you already know the answer and to go seeking the answer. Um, it, it is hard work, but it's also the most meaningful aspect of the work, I think, um, because, and it's the most gratifying part of the work because it means that you are never going to get bored. Resting in your laurels is boring. Um, and digging into new ideas and asking new questions and being surprised by the answers, that's fun. Uh, it's always fun. And so it, I, I find it actually really gratifying to approach the world in that way because, you know, no matter what I know, the best moments of my life are when the world has unlearned something I thought I knew before. Um, Unlearning is far better than knowing, uh, and it's far more satisfying uh, and it's far more fulfilling in a work context. So, so yeah, it, it, it can be hard work, um, but I, I also find it very zen-like. <laughs> um, you know, I look at every project and every every decision is like, well, here's an opportunity to ask some interesting questions and be completely surprised by what I learn. So, cool, let's go do it. Um, yeah, if I if I assume that I know the answers, then I'm surprised when I don't. Uh, and so instead, I go looking for the surprises because they're they're just a lot more satisfying. So we'll have to end there. My guest today is Robert Hopeman Jr. Robert, thank you very much. The book Tower of User Experience, um, love it. Couldn't recommend it enough. Appreciate your time. <laughs> There's a lot of paper tabs in there. There is. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm actually reading it. Right. I was awesome. clicking through this thing. It was great. Thanks, right. Robert. Thank very, you very so much. much, David. Take care.